the 10 things that all flat earthers say. Number one, one extremely problematic side effect of taking the globe and flattening it out into a plane is that gravity makes no sense and there is no reason for things to fall to the ground. Quite simply, objects fall or rise based on their relative density to the medium surrounding them. Apples fall because they are denser than the air, while helium balloons rise because they are lighter. No gravity necessary. This is why raindrops fall down through the air and air bubbles rise up through water. Everything seeks its relative density and rises or falls until settling accordingly. This is why a tiny pebble sinks to the bottom of the ocean, but gigantic cruise ships and aircraft carriers stay afloat on the surface, because even though a pebble is so small, its mass relative to its volume, its density, is more than water, so it sinks. And even though a cruise ship is so large, its mass relative to its volume is less than water, so it floats. If Newton's apple had landed in a puddle instead of on his head, he would have seen the apple only fell through the air because it was denser than the air, but then floated on top of the water because it was less dense than water. Have you ever noticed how it's easier to stay afloat with your lungs full of air than it is when they're empty? Submarines float on the surface when their ballast tanks are filled with air. But when the vents are opened and seawater floods in, they begin to sink as the submarine's density becomes greater than water. Depending what depth they wish to dive, sailors simply adjust the ratio of air and water in their tanks, and when ready to resurface, they blow compressed air into the tanks, forcing the seawater out, lowering the density, and thus causing them to rise back to the surface. We can also prove this fact of relative density by filling a balloon with approximately half helium and half air. Since helium is lighter than the oxygen, nitrogen, and other gases that compose the air around us, filling a balloon with just the right amount of helium to compensate for and balance out the density of the plastic results in a gravity-defying, levitating balloon at equilibrium that neither rises nor falls. All objects accelerate towards the ground at 9.8 meters per second squared. That's an indisputable fact. Oh, really? Is it an indisputable fact that feathers fall to the ground at 9.8 meters per second squared? Is it indisputable that dandelion seeds fall to the ground at that rate? What about skydivers with an open parachute? What if we are falling through water? The rate at which things fall has everything to do with the relative densities between the object and medium, and has nothing to do with the fictional pulling force of gravity, nor does the rate or manner in which objects fall have any bearing whatsoever on the shape of the earth. But this type of sophistry is the kind of tacky glue that holds the whole heliocentric model together. And it is also an indisputable fact that any acceleration requires a force to produce it. This is how cars drive, planes fly, people walk, cats jump. It's how literally all motion works. Most of you address this problem by simply listing two words, density and buoyancy. Well, I hate to break it to you guys, but these are not forces. Forces are vectors. They have a magnitude, which means a numerical amount, and a direction, which means they have to point somewhere. Density is simply mass per unit volume, or how much matter sits in a particular space. It doesn't point anywhere. And buoyancy is simply a measurement of an object's tendency to float. You say that objects fall down because they are more dense than the air below them. Why down? Why not up? Or sideways? When you let go of a ball, there is air all around it. How does it know to fall down? Also, objects fall down when they are in a vacuum, which means there is no air below them. What's happening there? I could similarly ask you if gravity is real and responsible for keeping all the world's buildings, oceans, and people stuck to the ground, then why does it have no effect on pulling down a simple children's balloon? Are helium balloons magical anti-gravity devices? No. We live in a density gradient. And since the combination of plastic and helium present in the balloon is less dense than the nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and other elements in the air around it, it rises. Likewise, if I release the helium and then blow up the balloon again, the magical anti-gravity properties disappear because now it is denser than the air around it. But wait, I thought Professor Dave, he's not really a professor, cool story though, bro, I thought 
not a Professor Dave, said that it's an indisputable fact that all objects fall to the ground at 9.8 meters per second squared. Why doesn't a balloon filled with carbon dioxide fall at this indisputable rate? Gravity is clearly racist against balloons, feathers, and other objects with relative densities near that of the medium surrounding them. Huh, Dave? So again, to answer your question, objects are not tending towards the Earth they are tending towards their density equilibrium. The least dense gases rise highest, while the most dense solids fall lowest. Here on Earth, so much solid matter has piled up in the dense direction that we actually have a platform to walk upon. But we are not yet at our density equilibrium, so we are constantly pushing downwards. Just as a helium balloon that rises and hits a ceiling has not yet reached its density equilibrium, and so it constantly pushes upwards on the ceiling. Number two, flat earthers all say, I shouldn't see this thing, but I do, so the earth is flat. Then to justify this claim, you all say the same thing, typically with no context whatsoever. Eight inches per mile squared. None of you have any idea what this means. You can't derive it. You can't calculate anything with it. You can't make a prediction with it. You can't tell me anything about this value at all. When I point this out to you, you get very angry, and instead of answering simple questions, you just link me to a bunch of videos made by con men. Eight inches per mile squared is not a valid way to measure Earth's curvature. If you understood math, you would immediately see that this squared on miles is totally out of place. That's because this is a parabolic approximation. This is for doing calculations with a parabola. It's possible that you remember this shape from middle school algebra, but I wouldn't be surprised if you don't. As you can see, the Earth is not shaped like this. So where does it come from and why do people use it? To begin with, the curvature formulas and curvature calculators that exist for the globe model were created by you globe Earth proponents, not us flat earthers. We are simply using the figures and formulas you yourselves claim as representing reality and proving through easily observable, demonstrable, repeatable results that the alleged curvature does not exist. Non-Professor Dave tries to belittle flat earthers for using the parabolic 8 inches per mile squared approximation, but then refuses to mention the fact that this formula gives the same results as the more complicated trigonometrical formula for up to 300 miles, which is far longer than anyone needs for practical curvature observations. The fact that observers at sea level on clear days can see islands, buildings, and mountains often over 50 to 100 miles away completely destroys the assertion that we live on a ball 25,000 miles in circumference. Regardless of which curvature formula or curvature calculator used, you can even check the Metabunk or other globe apologist sites, input the figures, and see that these simple observations are in complete defiance of the globe's math. Number three, all flat earthers say the same two things about water. The first is, water doesn't curve. And the second is, water finds its own level. The second phrase is completely meaningless, so the fact that you all say that exact thing verbatim is just one of the many demonstrations that you all blindly repeat what you hear without giving it a moment's thought. As for the first phrase, stating that water doesn't curve is at least a coherent thought. However, it is dead wrong. Put a drop of water on a piece of wax paper or a leaf. What does it look like? A freaking sphere. Isn't that something? In your haste to mindlessly parrot what you heard from flat earth priests about water, you forgot to look at water. Water curves, my friends. Look at this curved meniscus. Look at these waves. Water curves all the time. Holy snarky straw men, Batman. Not really a Professor Dave is stooping to new levels of sarcastic sophistry. Let me try doing this with that condescending cadence he delivers so naturally. Well, Dave, water most certainly does find its own level, and that's why water has been used as the number one most accurate leveling tool for thousands upon thousands of years. Water does not have the ability to stay piled upon itself so it will always flow outwards towards the lowest uncontained point. Once contained, the surface of undisturbed water will always remain level, with no deviation in elevation from one point to any other. As for the straw man, water doesn't curve, Dave has conveniently shortened this to suit his narrative, when he should have said, large bodies of water at rest do not curve. The claim is large bodies of water sticking to and curving around a ball, not a single drop of water beating. That is a false equivalency and a straw man. We are not talking about the beating of a single drop of water, nor the meniscus in a glass of water, nor static electricity bending running water towards a comb. So any of these sophist examples put forth trying to prove curved water do nothing but show the desperation of these pseudoscientists to come up with such red herrings. 
Number four, you are all quite perplexed about how Earth's atmosphere can exist next to the vacuum of space. This one is rather amusing because what's happening is that since you have no science education, your only context for the word vacuum is a vacuum cleaner. And again, because you have no science education, none of you understand how a vacuum cleaner works, which is a problem because you seem to think that outer space is a vacuum cleaner. Let's take a moment and clear this up. A vacuum is any region where there is no stuff. Here, there is stuff, like air. In space, there is no stuff, or at least very, very close to no stuff. Space is essentially empty. That's a vacuum. It is not a thing that sucks. Vacuums don't suck. Everyone say it with me together. Vacuums don't suck. Thanks so much for educating us on the subtle nuances and intricacies of how sucking works, Dave. I'm sure we all agree you are uniquely well qualified for explaining this subject. Unfortunately, though, your sucky straw man explanation still has not provided demonstrable proof of how a positive pressure system like Earth's atmosphere can exist adjacent to a negative pressure system like space without a solid barrier between the two. Anytime two opposing pressure systems come together without some solid membrane separating them, an equilibrium is quickly achieved. Nobody except Dave is saying space should suck Earth's atmosphere like a vacuum cleaner. We are saying, show us a demonstration of two opposing pressure systems without any solid barrier between them that do not equilibrate. If you cannot demonstrate this, but wish to claim this only happens at a scale too large for you to recreate, that is wishful thinking, not science. Number five, one of your favorite little gotcha challenges is to request that we demonstrate how water can stick to a ball spinning at a thousand miles per hour. The implication is that water and everything else should fly off of it like a child getting thrown from a merry-go-round. Well, it's very cute that you get overwhelmed by numbers with four digits in them, but in actuality, the earth spins once per day, one time in 24 hours. Get on a merry-go-round and have someone push you one time around over 24 hours. Not a very thrilling ride, is it? The issue is that the Earth is really, really big. So if instead of using rotational velocity to describe a rotating body like a normal person, you try to use linear tangential velocity, you're going to get a pretty big number. But to be honest, it's still not really that big. It seems you're the one getting overwhelmed by your own globe figures, Dave. The alleged speed at which your tilting, wobbling, spinning space testicle Earth is actually supposed to rotate at the equator is 1,039 miles per hour. We are all well aware that this means one rotation per day, but thanks for continuing to speak to your audience like illiterate, petulant children and pretending we cannot understand such basic concepts. Furthermore, this little water doesn't stick to a ball challenge is the strawiest straw man that was ever made of straw. The earth is huge. It generates an enormous gravitational field. That's why everything sticks to it. A ball is very tiny. It does not generate an enormous gravitational field, so things don't stick to it. So again, just like your last point, you cannot demonstrate water curving around and sticking to a ball, but wish to claim it only happens on a scale too large for you to recreate. That is no different from me claiming that unicorns exist, and when asked to show a single example of one, I cannot, but instead I say, unicorns do too exist, but they are macrocosmic invisible unicorns that cannot be observed. Invisible macrocosmic unicorns may exist in Dave's fantasy delusions, but if he cannot show a single demonstrable evidential example, it is by definition not scientific. Number six, lots of you say that moonlight is cold. This is astonishing for a number of reasons. The first is that it is not related to any claim you could possibly be making in order to argue for a flat earth. But the second and much more important detail is that it is the perfect demonstration of the fact that you have no clue how science works. Some flat earth priest measured the temperature under the moonlight and then again under something providing shade. Wow, moonlight makes it colder, but does it? Shouldn't you add some element of control to your experiment? What's a control, you ask? You see, your measurement isn't evidence of anything. You now have to repeat the experiment when there is no moonlight to make sure that the moonlight was indeed the cause of the discrepancy in temperature. This is something you should have learned in middle school, but don't worry, I'll finish the experiment for you. Take the measurements again on a night with a new moon so that there is no moonlight. Look at that, you'll get the same result. So the moonlight absolutely wasn't the reason for the discrepancy in temperature. There are countless videos proving moonlight to be colder than moonshade, including peer-reviewed published experiments like in the Lancet Journal. People can perform their own research on this topic, but I have to point out the obvious flaw Dave seems to have overlooked while he was so busy talking down to his audience. Dave assumes we don't know what a control is, and insists that doing the experiment on different days during different phases of the moon will give different temperatures. Yes, Dave, of course it will, because it's a different day. Control experiments must be done simultaneously for them to be able to control for anything. Redoing the experiment under different conditions on a different day is anything but a control. Regardless, the experiment has been done countless times by different people with the same results. Moonlight, especially during the full moon, is colder than moonshade. You did get one thing right, though, and that is that this, once again, has nothing to do with flat Earth. It's funny how desperate you are to come up with 
ten things all flat earthers supposedly say, yet several of your examples are just random red herrings that have nothing to do with the shape of the earth. Number seven. Many of you say some unintelligible nonsense about water flowing uphill or that on the globe model some rivers flow uphill. This one is so stupid that I genuinely can't believe any human could fall for it. You'll look at a globe and say that a river flows this way and that this is somehow uphill because you seem to think that up on the screen is some kind of universal up in space. Listen up. There is no up and down in space. This is not up. This is not down. To believe so would be as dumb as thinking that on Earth, whichever way you happen to be facing, is north. No one on Earth is upside down or on their side. Up on Earth is away from the surface of the Earth, no matter where you are on the Earth. Here in yet another example of globe earthers trying to make common sense sound like nonsense, we hear that up is not up and down is not down. People live stuck all around a ball earth, but nobody is sideways or upside down. Globe believers hate thinking about people being sideways or upside down on their silly ball, so they just claim there is no such thing as up or down to calm their fevered brains. But regardless of their internal mind games, their ball model has people stuck at any and all of 360 degree inclinations around the thing, which means people would by necessity be walking around sideways and upside down relative to one another. Likewise, Earth's many hundreds of rivers are constantly flowing north, south, east, west, and every other intermediary direction simultaneously, some of which flow for hundreds of miles with only the slightest of change in elevation an absolute impossibility on a globe of given proportions. Number eight. Many flat earthers remain dumbfounded by the idea that the earth is slightly closer to the sun in winter than in summer. As I've said before, winter up north is summer down south and vice versa. So your confusion is one of northern hemisphere narcissism, but it is also one of complete ignorance. Here's the earth. Here's the light coming from the sun. Look at this portion. It hits the earth straight on. Look at this portion. Because of the curvature of the earth, the light hits the surface at an angle and is therefore distributed around a greater area. Same amount of heat distributed around a larger area, lower average temperature. This is absolutely trivial to understand. Thanks, Dave. Nobody is dumbfounded or confused about these simple pseudoscientific claims you're making. We're simply presenting the inconsistencies of your model to you in question form because we're used to thinking for ourselves and allowing others to think for themselves rather than condescendingly talking down to everyone from a pedestal like you're some infallible superior being armed with objective truth. The question is simple. How can the globe model purport the sun to be approximately 3 million miles closer to Earth in January, when winter and colder temperatures are found all over the Earth, than in July, when Earth experiences its warmest temperatures? Dave claims due to the ball Earth's tilt, different places receive different amounts of direct sunlight, and that is what produces the seasonal and temperature changes. This makes no sense, however, because if the sun's heat travels over 90 million miles to reach the ball Earth, how could a slight tilt, a mere few thousand miles maximum, negate the sun's 90 million mile journey, giving us simultaneous tropical summers and Antarctic winters? Ball believers also say the sun is one million times larger than the earth, so regardless of how you tilt the globe, there will still be plenty of direct sunlight. Number nine, many flat earthers refer to the body of scientific knowledge as scientism. This is meant to be derogatory, implying that science is a religion. I'm very sorry, but saying this just demonstrates that you know nothing about science and probably didn't pass a single science class in high school. Science students are not told what to believe. They are shown how to perform experiments. Even in high school physics, students use blocks and ramps and balls and pendulums and carts and rulers and timers to derive Newton's laws and many other such pillars of science. So using the word scientism only serves to disqualify you from adult conversation regarding science. In actuality, it is quite clear why you adopt this viewpoint, because you just accept whatever you hear if it's what you want to believe. This is why your beliefs are baseless. Since you are incapable of doing anything other than repeating what you are told, you assume that others are doing the same thing, but they are not. Scientism is simply another way of saying pseudoscience. For example, when you claim that bodies of water can curve around, stick to objects, and display the shape of said objects upon their surface, like the alleged ball earth under your alleged curved oceans, but cannot give a single demonstrable example on a scale small enough to recreate, that is called scientism, or pseudoscience. Likewise, when you claim that opposing pressure systems can exist side by side without a solid barrier between them, but cannot provide a single evidential example of this claim, you are spouting more scientism. And to wrap things up, number 10. 
the piece de resistance, the claim that we have all been indoctrinated, that we have been brainwashed by schools, by the government, by NASA, by Freemasons, by Hollywood, take your pick. Well, as I have demonstrated in this clip, you all say the same exact ridiculous things word for word like you're reciting the oath of the Flat Earth Fraternity, so it's a rather silly accusation to be throwing around. The fact that you all say the same things is not surprising in the slightest. What do you do when you want to brainwash someone? You tell them they have already been brainwashed. Yes, globe earthers say flat earthers have been brainwashed, and flat earthers say globe earthers have been brainwashed. But think about this. Globe earthers are simply advocating the first version of reality they were taught as little children. Meanwhile, all flat earthers were actually taught that exact same version of reality as children, the only difference being that they went back as adults and did their due diligence in researching the opposing arguments without any bias or cognitive dissonance to see whether or not what they were taught as children still stood up to the critical scrutiny of a discerning adult. Then, after doing so, and finding fatal flaws in the model, these discerning adults went against all of society, enduring endless insults and ridicule, many losing friends and family members in the process, all for daring to question this globe gospel. So tell me, Professor, who sounds more brainwashed? The diligent and discerning adults able to override their initial bias and cognitive dissonance enough to research and reach a completely opposite understanding of that which was first taught to them? Or those who simply continued believing what they were originally taught as children?